The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... concept you use to try to describe it has its own built-in booby trap. Yes, I'm interested. I'm always interested in buying land. Now, how much is an acre? We don't sell it by the acre. We sell it by the day. A hundred pounds sterling a day. Well, how can you sell land by the day? We sell you as much land as you can walk around in a 24-hour period. As much land as I can walk around for a hundred pounds sterling? Yes. That's the deal. Our mystery drama, How Much Land Does a Man Need? is especially adapted from a story by Leo Tolstoy for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. in law the rule of primogeniture. It means that the firstborn son inherited the father's entire estate. What did the other sons do? Well, they did the best they could. Many of them emigrated to one of the 13 colonies. Since they were landless people to begin with, land became an obsession with some of them. And where you have an obsession, there's usually a tale to be told. Thus, we have the saga of Thomas Morgan, who came to Virginia in the year 1750, a penniless lad of 20. And now, ten years later, they say he owns practically every acre of land in Culver County. How did it happen? Listen. I believe you missed him. Huh? Oh, it's you. Didn't hear you coming. Well, I didn't want to spoil your aim. Uh, you upset a man sneaking up that way, Tom. I wasn't sneaking. Just moving along quietly. Yeah, thought I had him, too. Yeah, deer that's moving that fast, you have to give him more lead. You fired well behind him, you waste powder and shot. Waste not one. Not. That's what you want to tell me, I suppose. I was up to your farm this morning, Paul. Martha said you'd be out here hunting. I was surprised to hear. A man's got to hunt for his food these days. Yeah, especially if he neglects to plant it. What's that supposed to mean? Six months from now, I don't want to see you sitting around Hot Setter's Tavern with all the rest of the loafers complaining how I cheated you out of your land. You ain't got my land yet, Tom. You haven't even started your Kick flower. your long nose out of my affairs. I'd like to. But you're the one that came looking for me. You're the one that borrowed from me. Where else was I going to go? You're the only one in town with ready cash. You know why? Yes, I do know why. I work, I save. And stayed home from the war. Every other able-bodied man in this town enlisted and Colonel George Washington's militia regiment. Yes, and you know why? Because he thought he could get away from his wife and go sparking and skylarking all over the province of Pennsylvania. All you did was drink and carouse. I fought. I shed my blood so as you could keep your scalp. So as you wouldn't get burned out of house and home. Yes, but none of this is getting your crop into the ground, Tom. Well, I ain't going to be able to get a crop into the ground till next spring. No. You know it. You knew it when you... You let me have that money. I knew it? You knew about the range. You knew about the floods. You knew how, how it'd come down day after day, like like the time in the Bible. <laughs> what are you saying? You knew there could be no plow and no plant. No, how could I know? <laughs> you know how. He told you. He? Who told me? Your lord and master, the devil himself. Oh, you're a sick man, Paul Devereaux. You have no strength for fighting. Otherwise, you and I would have to take our coats off right now. Why? Because I'm saying the truth. You've been drinking whiskey. 
Everybody knows you made a bargain with the devil. Oh, is that what I did? Didn't you? Why else has every scheme of yours succeeded? I believe in you now, Paul. Before I do something, I'll be sorry, Paul. Sorry? <laughs> Does the devil or any of his own know the meaning of sorrow? Can they even feel remorse? Uh, you made me take that money. Now, you just hold on. Uh, you came to me. You asked for the money. I did nothing to make you take it. You're going to refuse me. Oh, refused. And then I'd be branded a miser, eh? A skinflint, a man immune to the sufferings of his fellow. You knew I really didn't need the money. I could have scraped along without it. And how would I know that? Your master told you. Offer him the money. He cannot withstand temptation. Make him mortgage his farm. You always wanted that farm. It's more land, land. Oh, man. Offer him the money. He'll drink it away, gamble it away. There's no point to any of this, Paul. And then the land will be yours. I am here to remind you. The note falls due in November. You know, I won't be able to pay it. I know the twist in industry makes all things possible. Now, what if a man ain't thrifty? What if he ain't industrious? Does he has to be turned out of his house like a, like a beggar? What is it you want me to do? Tear up the note? Give me more time. I already gave you a year. Just, just a little more time. To do what? To go drinking some more? You're taking the bread out of the mouths of my children. You never so much as placed a single morsel into the mouth of any child that bears your name. The bread they eat, they earn by the sweat of their brow. I I got the rheumatism, bad time. I got her campaigning with Colonel Washington. I got her marching in the rain, lying down to sleep in the snow. You can't put me out. You just can't. I won't. If you pay your debt. Where am I going to get the money? Well... Good morning, Tom. Well, good morning, James. Well, what are you doing here? I... Well, unless I'm off in my reckoning, it's the first day of the month. Yes, Tom, it is. And why are you here in the county now? Why aren't you out collecting? Tom, I... We should talk about that. Well, what's there to talk about? I can't take it no more. Take what, James? All these folks that owe you money. They're friends of mine. Well, they're friends of mine, too. No, sir, they're not. They're not? I suppose maybe I shouldn't have said that, but it's true. No, don't stop. You're the most hated man in Virginia. Because I want my money. Tom, I'm the one that knocks on the doors. I'm the one that has to ask. I'm the one that has to have my heart torn out by the side of the women crying. I'm the one the men curse at. Where am I going to get the money? Where am I going to get the money? And how do you answer them? Answer them? There ain't no answer. Yes, there is. Work for the money. Work for it. Money is formed from the sweat of your brow. You go into the fields at sunrise, you work till sundown, and that's how you make money grow. You take it from the land. I can't talk that way to people I've known all of my life. Well, if you want to work for me, you'd better learn how. Well, that's a lesson I could only learn from the devil, the way you did. Now, tell me something, James. There's a story making the rounds that I am somehow in league with the devil. Yes, there is. And do you believe it? I do. Hmm. Well, then I suppose you want to leave my employ. I should. But? Maybe I can save you. Make you reject the devil. <laughs> you sound like the parson. Let me save you, Tom. Give up this lust for land. You already have enough. No, no. How much land does a man need? How much? All he can get his hands on. No, Tom. He needs much less, considerably less than that. Uh, this is getting the day's work done. Tom, I can't go to those poor people and ask them for money. I know they don't have. I'm the wrong man for the job. No, James. You are the right man. In a part-time preacher, you can give a person spiritual consolation while you pick up his mortgage. Mrs. Powell. May I come in? Believe me, of course. Uh, you have a chair? Thank you. 
May I offer my sincerest condolences on the passing of your husband? Thank you. Major Powell was a great and good man. He truthfully, he wasn't great, and he could have been better. We needn't discuss Major Powell. Very well. What shall we discuss? So, this is the den of the devil. <laughs> this is merely my humble counting house. Where was the bargain, sir? Oh, in this very room. He appeared to you here? Yes. Yeah. Ah, suddenly. He materialized suddenly. And there he was in that very chair you're sitting in. Really? Mm. What did he look like? Mm, just as you might imagine. Horn, pitfall? Mm -hmm, red as a boiled lobster, breathing a sulfurous fire. And you sold him your soul? Uh, no, no, that deal could not be consummated. Why? Well, it turns out I have no soul. <laughs> then what happened? Oh, he disappeared. Haven't seen him since. Then... There was no bargain. I'm sorry you're disappointed. Oh, alas, the popular legend. And your fabulous successes, am I to assume they have all been engineered on your own? I'm afraid so. Bereft, as it were, of all Mephistophelian assistance. That is exactly the case. I'm happy to hear that. Well, now, Mrs. Powell, how may I be of aid? Uh, let us return briefly to my late husband, Major Powell. He left me his young children, his home, his plantation, his various affairs, to go soldiering with Colonel Washington of Fairfax County. Yes, I believe I've heard of the gentleman. They were very good friends. Major Powell, unfortunately, received a bullet wound at Fort Duquesne, from which he never really recovered. Colonel Washington and his wife attended the funeral. Well, I'm sorry I was called away on urgent business. Mrs. Washington was a widow. She'd been married to the wealthiest man in Kent County, a Colonel Custis. Yes, the name is familiar. She told me something very enlightening. She said that her marriage to Colonel Washington was something that was destined. Indeed. She was the wealthiest woman in the province of Virginia. He was the most eligible bachelor. He is a man of ability, intelligence, character. She needed a husband for herself, a father for her small children, a manager for her estate. So you see, it was literally a match made in heaven. Uh, these affairs that are ordained in heaven usually require assistance down here below. Oh, they were brought together. They had mutual friends who arranged to have them meet. Unfortunately, we do not. We? Yes, we. I am the wealthiest woman in Culver County. You are the richest man. I have children to raise. I have an estate to manage. There is no reason why we shouldn't marry. I see. In the ordinary way, we would have been brought together. There is no shortage of volunteer cupids, <laughs> except for this unfortunate rumor that came to you. People actually believe you belong to the devil. I've heard that. So I must do all the work myself. I must bring to your attention the desirability of such a match. Have I done so? You have. Then, all that remains is for you to propose. Or would you require some time to think it over? time do you need if you're an eligible bachelor? The woman is attractive, rich, she's willing. Love? In those days, people didn't marry for love. They married for what were considered to be solid, sensible reasons. I shall return shortly with Act Two. It's all a matter of timing, really. Today you fall in love and you get married. Years ago, people got married, and then they fell in love. Which way is better? Who knows? We're dealing with the emotions of men and women, which means that all bets are off. Anything can happen. And we have to play it by ear. Do I understand, Mrs. Powell, that you are asking me to propose marriage? I believe I have outlined a set of circumstances that would make such a step not only logical, but satisfactory. You have extensive holdings in Culver County. Over 2,000 acres. Yes, I've always had my eye on that land. And here is your opportunity to own it. Mrs. Powell, you have been frank with me. I have been exceedingly frank. I'm still unable to believe I could have summoned the audacity to speak to a man in such a manner. May I be equally frank? Please. I have long... What is the word? Coveted? Yes, I have long coveted Colonel Powell's land. It is the richest 
in this part of the province. That's acknowledged by everyone. And for years, I have set about to secure it. Your husband was not very communicative with you about his affairs. Half of your land is already under mortgage to me. What are you saying? I have the papers. You may examine them. But... Further, you are completely unequipped to manage the affairs of your plantation. You are being swindled every day by everyone. For instance, your overseer rents out your slaves without your knowledge and pockets the money. Well, that's impossible. I, I, I know John Raines. Let us say you know one side of John Raines. Your manager, Lewis Marvin, keeps half the money from the sale of your farm and dairy products. I can only hint at the arrangements he has with various shopkeepers. But these were my husband's best friends. Now, hear the worst. You have ruined most of your land by growing tobacco season after season. But tobacco is the best cash crop. Yes, it also exhausts the soil. Now, it will have to lie fallow for three or four years to renew itself. You will have to borrow money. You will have to come to me. And what makes you think Where that... else can you go? You won't be able to pay it back. Slowly, surely, all your land will fall into my hands anyhow. I don't have to marry you for it. Oh, I never thought anyone could state something in such cold blood. It's only a matter of degree. Your proposal to me was hardly warm-blooded. Oh. You brought me a business proposition. You can't deny it. And all I've done is tell you that I can do better. Yes. But isn't there something else? Such as? I'm not unattractive. I can be pleasant, even exciting company. I know how to make a man happy, how to make his home beautiful, his life agreeable. Isn't there such a thing as, as companionship? Companionship. And all those other things, I agree, they are of primary importance to some people, but not to me. I have never felt the need for them. Then the story you told me as a joke was true. The devil did materialize in this room. I'm afraid he did not. Yes, he did. And he bought your soul. I told you, I never had one. He did. A small, sickly, shriveled soul. But the devil would settle for that. What other kind can he buy? Good day, Mr. Morgan. I'm sorry we have no basis for doing the kind of business you had in mind, Mrs. Powell. You leave a person with very little. The truth is, you came with very little. Oh. And you made sure that I shall depart with nothing at all. Please remember, Mrs. Powell, coming here was your idea, not mine. Yes, it was. My rather foolish, senseless idea. I had permitted myself to believe that we had something in common. Really? And what would that be? Something very elementary, I thought. At least we were both members of the human race. Surely such a statement is rather beneath you. It's a simple statement of fact. I would assume a lady of breeding and culture would not stoop to pointless insult. You do not insult a man when you tell him the truth. You may injure his vanity, but that's another matter. I have no vanity. True. And no humanity either. And that is my point. You fascinate me, Mr. Morgan. You are the only completely evil person I know. <laughs> evil? I injure no one. Mm, you do worse. You give them the opportunity to injure themselves. Yes. This is evil practice on the highest, or I should say, lowest level. You have transformed evil almost into an art. But why, Mr. Morgan? Why? What will become of you? Where shall you be in the end? I shall not find myself in the almshouse as a public charge. Is that the answer? Fear of poverty. I fear nothing. I shall never be poor as long as I own land. And the more I own... Yes? How much land do you want? How much land do you need? How much land does any man need? How much? Yes. Someday, when you find the answer, you might let me know. Sir, have I the privilege of addressing Mr. Thomas Morgan, Esquire? You have. And what might your name be? Porter. Peter Dorianus Porter, Esquire. Uh, how may I serve you, Mr. Porter? I have come to serve you. Ah. In what way, sir? Mr. Morgan, your fame has spread far and wide. I'm not aware of the fact that I'm famous. But you are. No one is more avid to acquire land. And no one in King George's colonies from Massachusetts to Georgia drives a harder bargain. Are you saying I take advantage of people? Of course. 
But that is what business is all about, wouldn't you say? I shall say nothing until I've heard you out. Good. A man after my own heart. I have come to sell you land. Yes, the finest land on the face of the earth. Land that makes everything in Virginia and even the other 12 states look like swamp or desert, which indeed most of it is. I assume you own this land you are offered. No, I am merely an agent, a seller's agent. Where is this land? Over the mountains and far to the west. <laughs> are you mad? To the west is the Ohio Territory, property of the crown. No one may go there, much less buy land. I am not talking about the Ohio Territories. I have in mind something infinitely finer. Yes? Do you know where the Mississippi River is? The Mississippi? The Frenchman found it. The Frenchman claimed it. But their time has come and gone. The Sioux own it. The Sioux, the Blackfeet, the Cheyenne, the Ute. Who are they? Indians. I never heard of them. Of course. To you, Indians are Chasto, Cherokee, Algonquin, Tuscarora. No. These are different Indians. They live on the vast plains beyond the Mississippi. Fantastic rolling plains. Where the earth is so black, so rich, so fertile, you can almost watch the seed sprout as it takes root. But it is forbidden to go there. Forbidden? By whom? The crown. Yes, that's true. Well, shouldn't that end the discussion? It should if you were a little man. Little men cannot see beyond the length of their noses. Little men hear the literal word of the law. Would you agree? Sir, I fear we waste each other's time. Do me the honor to read this piece of parchment, Mr. Morgan. Well, what does it say? Um, I, Great Eagle, Chief of the Oglala Sioux, do hereby appoint Mr. Peter Doremus Porter to act as my agent in all matters appertaining to the selling of the tribal lands. You mean an Indian wrote this? No, of course not. I dictated it for him, and there he has marked his card. Oh, this is nonsense. Great Eagle is a visionary. He has read the future. Sir, I am a man of affairs. I... You speak of the lands in the Ohio Territories and beyond as being possessions of the crown. Yes, sir, aren't they? Not for much longer. Indeed. Within two decades, the English crown shall no longer rule over this country. And who says so? You say so, for one. Me? I have never uttered a word of treason. The sound of treason? <laughs> Perhaps not. But has there never been the thought of treason? Who are you? You may not even be aware of it, but it's all seething deep down inside. Sam Adams openly advocates secession up in New England. Well, I have nothing in common with those Boston hotheads. You have Patrick Henry here in Virginia. Sir, what has begun as merely a pointless discussion has now become treasonous. You know as well as I do, it has to come. The inevitable rebellion, the eventual separation. At least profit by it. Be prepared. There will be a rush westward. Buy your land now. But why do you come to me? Because no one is more anxious to buy land. No one is as driven as you are. Who are you? An agent for Chief Great Eagle. Now, listen, my friend. The chief will sell you all the land you want. <laughs> yes, but why? Because the chief is a magician. He sees what is soon to happen. Uh -huh. When the white man landed all along the Atlantic shore, what did he do to the Indians? Well, now, what does this have to do with... Everything... The Indian was driven out, banished into the wilderness. Chief Great Eagle knows he cannot fight the white man. The white man has too many guns. Therefore, he will sell the land now while he can. He will sell me land? Yes. Find me a white man who desires land, he said to me, and I shall sell him all the land he wants. But how does he sell it? How much per acre? Oh, Great Eagle doesn't sell land by the acre. No. He sells it by the day. <laughs> How can you sell land by the day? It's very simple. There's no end to the land. It stretches on and on forever. So, therefore, you can have as much land as you can walk around in a day. A full day? Oh, yes. <laughs> 24-hour day. Mm. Do you know how much land I can walk around in a day? I would imagine a considerable amount. It would encompass miles and miles. Especially if one is a fast walker. How much money does he ask? A hundred pounds a day. Regardless of how far you walk? Regardless. Just think. A hundred pounds. Who are you? You must be the devil. You always said no such person exists. Yes. But only the devil could know so much about me. Mr. Morgan, I'll tell you what the devil is. He is a specter created by little minds, jealous minds. 
Inferior people cannot tolerate success in others. They cannot admit that successful people achieve their goals because they're smarter. And so they explain their own failures by claiming the triumphs of others are achieved by the aid of the devil. Yes, but... You raise this point with me, Mr. Morgan. You, of all people. Haven't you been accused of being in league with the devil? Of having sold your soul to the devil? You, sir, are living proof of what I have said. They envy you your superior knowledge, courage. Yes, but the fact remains... What fact? Have I asked you for anything? A hundred pounds is all you give the chief. And what do I give you? Me. You give me nothing. Nothing? Then why do you do it? I am paid by the chief. And that's all? That's all that need concern you. In 24 hours. If I walk fast, I can make a circle to include thousands of acres and all... Oh, for a for hundred pounds? One hundred pounds. Not one penny more, not one penny less. And, and you ask me for nothing? My dear Mr. Morgan, what do you have that I could possibly want? When can we leave? When can you go? Tomorrow morning. I'm at your service. That's what life is, wouldn't you say? A constant journey in which we seek an answer. For some, the journey is longer than others. For some, the answer is more complicated than others. Of course, it all depends on the question. You might philosophize for a moment and ask yourself, what is the nature of your journey? And then, before you know it, I shall return with Act Three. western part of the crown colony of Virginia in the year 1760, some 15 years before the revolution. And our Mr. Thomas Morgan, accompanied by the mysterious Mr. Peter Doremus Porter, is journeying toward the mighty Mississippi. And day after day, they ride through deep, dark, brooding forests and vast, rolling plains. And every day, Thomas Morgan asks, when shall we get there? And always, Peter Doremus Porter replies, soon... But late one afternoon, when Tom Morgan asks Peter Porter that same question, he gets a different reply. We are there now. What? We are there now. You mean... You mean this, where we are? This this is the place we have been seeking? Yes. Here. Are you disappointed? No, no. Is it the way I described it? Yes, yes. Y- you're sure th- this is the land I can buy? Listen. What's that? The drum. They know we're coming. They're waiting for us. Yes, well, I hope they know why we're coming. We could be attacked. No. These Indians have not yet suffered at the hands of the white man. And so we shall be welcome. Come, let's ride. Oh, where are they? Where you hear the sound of the drum. Just over that ride. Come. Hundreds of them. They attend their chief, Great Eagle. But why are they so quiet? They're a quiet people. They're, they're moving their hands. Why are they moving their hands like that? They're speaking in sign language. Do you understand what they're saying? Yes. They're saying, welcome and enjoy long life. Well, now what do we do? We wait. For what? For the chief to command us to approach. Well, well everything is all right, isn't it? I mean, it is going the way it's supposed to, isn't it? Of course. See? He motions us to move forward. Come, ride slowly. He's a very old man, huh? Very old. Very wise. Oh. oh. My brother. My brother. Chief, this is my brother, Thomas Morgan. Then he is also my brother. Why have you come to me, my brother? Answer him. I, uh, I have come to buy land. Hmm. How much land do you need? Well, I want all the land I can get. Hmm. But how much land do you need? How much land do I need? <laughs> as much as I can walk around in a day. You have not answered my question, my brother. How much land do you need? He has come here to learn the answer. I see. Then let us begin. Now? Yes, now. This is what you came for, isn't it? 
He knows what he must do. I have explained it. Does he have hundred pounds? In silver, in this little sack. He must place it on ground. Obey him, Thomas. Drop the sack. Well, what do I do now? Dismount. All right. And now, my brother, you must walk. In which direction? In any direction. As far as you like. And you must return. All land you can walk around is yours. But how will I know where I have gone? My brother shall go with you and mark the ground. Do you see setting sun? Uh, yes, I do. See, it begins to disappear beyond the rim of that far distant hill. When it has gone completely, you shall begin to walk. Do you understand, tell me? Uh, I understand. And you must walk all night and all following day. And you must return here to where I stand before the next sun shall disappear over that same hill. Or you lose your hundred pounds. You will have walked for nothing. Go in peace, my brother. Discover how much land you need. That's a bright moon. How easy it is to see. How far do you intend to walk in this direction? I have schemed it out. I can walk 30, even 40 miles in 24 hours. I, I do have 24 hours. Oh, yes. A 40-mile circle. Do you need all that land? Oh, yes, yes, every foot of it. And what will you do with it? Well, I shall grow wheat, corn, raise cattle, build a home. It shall be a palace. And who will live there? Oh, my wife, my children. When shall you have time for a wife? Uh, when I have all the land I want. But you want all the land in the world. Yeah, are you marking my path? Yes, good. Well, hurry, hurry, walk faster. But we have a long way to go. We have less than a day now. See, look, the moon is beginning to wane. Soon it'll be daylight. Shouldn't you stop? <laughs> what for? Rest. Sleep for an hour or two. Sleep. Remember, <laughs> it has been a long, hard journey and you're tired. No, no, not I. If you sleep, you will rise refreshed. But this is the time to walk. Now, before dawn, when it's cool, I can cover great distances. Are you marking this trail? Yes, I am marking the trail. <laughs> I don't hear anything. You don't hear that drum? No. <laughs> Must be my imagination. You're very tired. You really should rest. Oh, come on. You just keep marking the trail. You should <laughs> sit for a moment. No, no, come. The sun is very bright, very hot. We shall rest when it's directly overhead, and the heat will be at its worst. Rest now, this beautiful spring. Drink some water. Stop. It's only for a minute. In a minute, I can walk two or three hundred yards. Now, do you know how much land that is? Do you know how many bushels of wheat you can plant? <clears throat> how many stalks of corn you can grow? Your face is flushed. You're breathing heavily. You're uh, drenched with sweat. Just mark the trail. Just mark the trail. You must start heading back now. No, no, I am, I am. I have been moving in a circle. A wide circle. Narrow. I will, I will. No, wait, wait, wait. I must go to the right again. See that hollow? <laughs> Perfect for growing flax. You are limping. I am nothing, nothing. My, my feet. Rest. You still have time. You're in pain. A day to suffer. A lifetime to live. Tom. Tom Morgan. Tom. Who's that? It's me. <laughs> Who, who, who are you? Can't you tell? It's, it's Paul. Paul Devereaux. What are you doing out here, Paul? I, I, I came for the same thing you did, Tom. Land. But I, I was too greedy. I, I walked too far, too fast. Help me, Tom. How can I help you? Bring me some water. I'm dying of thirst. I don't have any water. There's a stream just a mile away. You, you passed it. Yes, yes, I know. Please, please go back there. Get me some water. I don't have time. God, I gotta have some water. It's past noon. The sun's getting lower in the sky. <laughs> Tom, please. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. Here's a doctor. Hello, Tom. Sally. Sally Powell. Why are you here? For the land. Sally. Am, am I dreaming? 
come back with me. Go back with you? You said you wanted to build a home for wives, for children. I do, but... Then you must begin now. Walk back with me and start to build now. Don't you have enough land? No, I don't have enough land. I'll never have enough land. Yes, you will. I'm wasting time standing here talking to you. I've already lost a cornfield, a wheat field, a stand of timber. You'll have enough land one day, Tom Morgan. One day you'll discover you have just enough. Tom. Tom, wake up. What? I must wake up. It's time to start back. What? I've been sleeping. Yes. How long? How long have I been asleep? The sun. Look, look, the sun is its getting lower. You had just enough time to get back. Why did you let me sleep? You just fell to the ground. I tried to wake you. I must get back. The sun will go down. Have you been marking my trail? Wait. You're going in the wrong direction. No, no. That piece right up ahead with, with, with the stand of trees. I want it. I have to have it. No, Tom. You have enough. No. Start back. Start back now. Oh, you won't have any at all. Just as far as that. That little, pretty little brook. The sun. Look at the sun. It's no longer a brilliant yellow flame. It's become a dull red ball. Look at the sun. Soon you won't be able to see it anymore. Yes, you're, you're right. You're right. I, I, I have to get back. Now. You must hurry. Yes. I'm walking as quickly as I can. Stop the town. Oh, oh. You'll have to run. I'm so tired. You won't get to the land. All this oh. great and beautiful land. Fine. You won't get any of it. It's fine. It's fine. Not if you don't get back before sunset. Back. Back where? Where? Uh, up ahead. Up uh, that hill. Uh, so far. Run. So far. Run. Oh, I can't breathe. The sun is a great red ball. And the lower part of the rim is already touching the top of the hill. Hurry. That's it. Don't stop. No. You make oh, it. can't. Keep going. Uh, my legs. I know your heart is bursting. Uh, your legs are melting. Stop. Stop. Stop now. Stop. And you lose the land. Oh, all the land. Oh. Do you want to lose the land? Oh, never. Never. I'll make it. I'll make it. The sun. The sun is already over the hill. Pasha. Pasha. I'll make it. Just a little bit further. Just a little bit. I'll make it. Ah, the chief. I, I'm coming. I, I'm here. Oh, I made it. I made it. See the very edge. There, the rim. Still above the hill. Has he made it, chief? Yes, oh. my brother. Oh. He has made it. Oh. Catch him. Catch him, he falls. Oh, oh. oh Thomas Morgan, oh. my brother. Oh. You have all the land you need. No. Oh. No. Oh. I want more. Yes, you want more. But you do not need more. See, your eyes close slowly. Your breath no longer shakes your body. Now it leaves you. It leaves you forever. A pity, Chief. A pity. Hmm. But he has learned how much land he needs. Take the hole. Six feet from his head to his heels. Yes, my brother. Six feet of the earth is all the land a man will ever need. all he ever gets to keep, as far as we know. They buried him somewhere in the great central plain of our country, and when Tolstoy wrote this story originally, they buried him somewhere on the illimitable steppes of Siberia. And they weren't Sioux Indians, but a Tartar tribe called the Bakshirs. We've changed very little because wherever we live, however we dress, whatever we call ourselves, we're the same people. I'll be right back. our story with a philosophical discussion concerning the word enough. How much is enough? Are we any wiser now? Our story took place before the so-called industrial revolution. Today, science has given us measuring instruments of fantastic accuracy. We can measure the width of the nucleus of the invisible atom. If only we could measure the intensity 
of the simple human emotions. What is enough? And when does it become too much? Our cast included Paul Hecht, Gordon Heath, Patricia Elliott, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Why, you're not a man at all. You, you got hair clean down to your waist. Here, take your cap and tuck it up. Back up again. No wonder you wouldn't shoot. Who are you, anyhow? My real name's Loretta Janet. Well, it doesn't matter. I, I, I grew up in a convent. But when my country was called to arms, a, a voice told me I should take them up, too. I, I cut my hair and I dressed myself in men's clothes and I volunteered. Who did this? Who did you think you were, Joan of Arc? Uh, I followed my conscience. My sex doesn't matter. What does is I am a soldier. And yet when it came to the pinch, you couldn't shoot to save the South. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.